I know many of you who have registered, but for those I don't know, my name is Elizabeth Heald and I'm the president and CEO of the Kitchener Waterloo Community Foundation. And I am so pleased to be moderating this discussion today. To begin, we'd like to acknowledge that Kitchener Waterloo Community Foundation and where we broadcast from today is situated on the lands from the Haldeman Tract Treaty of 1784, a formally ratified agreement acknowledging six miles on either side of the Grand River as treaty territory belonging to six nations of the Grand River. KWCF serves a region that is located within the traditional territories of the neutral, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee's people. This territory is within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon wampum. We acknowledge the enduring presence, knowledges and philosophy, philosophies, excuse me, of indigenous peoples living here today. We acknowledge the continuing accomplishments and contributions indigenous peoples make in shaping Waterloo region. Like many of you last week, on National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, our entire team honored the lost children and survivors of residential schools, their families and communities by participating in community walks and reflecting on the tragedies experienced by Indigenous peoples. And we are committed to understanding collective past experiences while celebrating inclusion of Indigenous voices within KWCF in order to vision and co-create collaborative, respectful paths together in mutuality and reciprocity. I will quickly go over the agenda for today's webinar. First, we will touch on why vital signs and why affordable housing. Then Steve Ayer will be joining us to go over some high level results of the vital signs report. And we will end with a panel discussion with Firel Diwan and Tennille Warren, followed by some next steps. I would like to thank our sponsors and supporters. Without your help, this report would not have been possible. Thank you to Equitable Life of Canada, Green Shield Canada, Kitchener Waterloo Association of Realtors, KPMG, and Libro Credit Union. This is one of the parts I miss about live events. I can't hear the roaring applause that would be happening right now. But to our sponsors who are joining today, please accept our heartfelt thanks. So why Vital Signs? For those who aren't familiar, Vital Signs is a community-driven data program that is led nationally by Community Foundations of Canada and locally by community foundations across Canada, including KWCF. The reports are used to better understand the vitality of communities on aggregate and also through unique experiences and realities of different groups within the community. KWCF published Waterloo Region Vital Signs for a number of years and then took a hiatus from Vital Signs since 2016. Today, KWCF is reintroducing a Waterloo Region Vital Signs report focused specifically on affordable housing to provide more information about this critical issue and most importantly, to help turn that knowledge into action. I would now like to invite up Stephen Ayer, president and founder of Common Good Strategies Consulting, the lead author and researcher of the Waterloo Region Vital Signs Report to present some key findings. In the essence of time, we are sharing Steve's bio in the chat right now. Steve, please take it away. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. So you should be able to see the slides on the screen now. So let me know if there's any uh, issues there. But other than that, I'll be jumping into it. So today I'm gonna to be talking through uh, Kitchener and Waterloo Community Foundation's Vital Signs Report focused on affordable housing. The report itself is more than 60 pages, uh, talks through uh, some of the consultations we did with more than 30 community experts, uh, highlights more than 100 different uh, sources, and has a variety of uh, primary data analysis, uh, data that had previously uh, been available but not uh, ever put and pulled together. And this only will cover a tiny fraction of it. So if there's anything that strikes you, I do highly encourage you to take a look at the full report and take a look specifically around some of the pages and data points that might be of interest to you, because there's a lot more notes and details available there. 
So I'm gonna go through some of the parts of the affordable housing crisis in Waterloo Region. And I think for to everyone on the line, it's probably not a surprise that I would call it a crisis, but we're gonna contextualize some of the reasons why and some of the challenges and potential solutions as we move into the discussion later on for what we're seeing in the, the Waterloo Region. So first off, I think a lot of people are quite familiar with some of the stats about how quickly Waterloo Region has been growing. And I was curious looking at how that compares to the rest of Canada and North America. So we pulled data for 290 metropolitan areas across Canada and the United States, every one with more than 500,000 people, and looked at over the last five years, how quickly have each of these communities been growing. And Waterloo Region, uh, Kitchener Cambridge Waterloo, actually the highest growth rate of any of the 290 communities across Canada and the United States at 12%, uh, adding more than 63,000 over the five most recent years. And I think this really speaks to some of the pr profound and significant challenges the region is facing, with uh, growing almost twice as fast as Canada overall, uh, more than four times, as, almost four times as quickly as the United States, and really surpassing any other region within this. Uh, others have grown with a higher number of people, but the rate specifically, we didn't see anyone growing faster. And you can see the more detail on the notes and methodology uh, in the full report. With that, it's really in the last five years that we've seen this really rapid acceleration in growth in the Waterloo region. So looking at 2016, the region added, uh, Kitchener Cambridge Waterloo added about 12,000 people up from about 5,000 the year before. And that increase in population growth has been pretty consistent year after year. And this is uh, as well, construction starts have been going up, but not nearly as quickly as population growth has. And I would add one note just as we have this slide. I know a number of you folks may have seen the presentation we had in June. There's gonna be a couple contextual slides at the beginning where we show some of the same data points, sometimes updated with more current or slightly adjusted methods. Uh, but for the vast majority of us, this will be new information, but there are a couple pieces that are repeating. So when we actually contextualize that growth, in the most recent five years versus the five years previous. When we look at population growth from 2011 to 2015, a five-year period in the Kitchener, Cambridge, Waterloo area, we had a 273% growth in population from 23,000 total people added in the uh, 2011 to 2015 period to just more than 63,000 people added in 2016 to 2020. And housing construction starts have also increased from about 15,000 over that five-year period prior to about 20,000 after. But really, even as that pace would be very impressive in a normal context, it really isn't adequate to keep up with that really rapid pace of growth. I mean, it's, there's a lot of con uh, con contestation around exactly how much housing is needed to support population growth. But no matter what, I mean, over the last five years, Waterloo Region has been many, many, many thousands of housing unit starts short of where it'd like to be to be able to compensate for this level of population growth. And I also want to take a bit of a tact just looking at this broader context of how Canada has been doing in the international market before we dive into some of the details about price and rent appreciation in the Waterloo region. And so the Economist magazine published data recently from 27 different rich countries. So the 27 richest countries in the world, uh, looking at data over time. And we pulled the data from 2005 to 2020, looking at how much different markets have appreciated in real terms. So this is adjusting for income and inflation growth over time. And across these 27 markets, Canada had the second highest appreciation in prices across any of those different mar uh, markets. Three times faster real growth beyond inflation and income than the average of these 27 countries. Uh, there, so that's uh, more than 20 times faster growth in real terms than the United States. And even after this data, we've seen that Canada has been a leader in the last year uh, with even greater price acceleration as the pandemic has gone on. And this really speaks to the broad context that Canada overall and many markets across this entire country are really seeing unprecedented growth in prices. And that causes some real challenges. <clears throat> so when we look at specifically, at data for Waterloo region. So we pulled data for 28 larger regions across uh, Canada using the MLS home price index. And of all those regions, Kitchener and Waterloo had the second highest growth of major markets across Canada. Um, 
growing at 282% from January 2005 to April 2021. And two points in terms of comparability. One, the time period is slightly different. And we have seen, even since the economists pulled together their index about a year ago, we've seen very, very rapid home appreciation. And two, this data does not adjust for real uh, in, uh, in price increases. So this is not directly comparable, but I think the key I think is Waterloo region is the second fastest growing uh, region within the second fastest growing country in the world. And I think this really speaks to why there's been such a, a rapid growth in challenges in this region is accommodated in this incredibly rapid growth in the middle of an environment of really unprecedented in modern history of uh, price appreciation. And uh, overall, when you just like compare the Kitchener-Waterloo to the aggregate across Canada, we see 80% faster growth in the Kitchener uh, and Waterloo area. And Cambridge is slightly slower increases, but still one of the top across the entire uh, country as well. And this, uh, we do have the full data, a much more comprehensive set of data in the actual um, um, uh, full report. So again, this is another chart that we, uh, you may have seen previously. It's been updated slightly. But this goes to show the income versus home prices. And we don't have actual income for a lot of different years, but we did have actual income for the, the region for 2005, 2010, and 2015 from the National Household Survey and the Canadian censuses. So we use that to estimate income in each of the other years. And really what we see is income in this region is barely growing faster than inflation. At the same time as we are seeing these incredibly fast appreciation in home prices. So in 2005, January 2005, the typical home price in Kitchener and Waterloo was 196,000, where the income in the census that year was 65,000. So about three times higher income than home prices. When we look in the most recent year, we see a 749,000 in July 2021 versus an estimated income of probably around 87,000 for the typical household, a ratio of about 8.6 times higher. And this, I think, is where it's, it's quite uh, in a phenomenal and mind-blowing comparison of looking across these times and seeing just how rapidly, and particularly in the last five or six years, this decline in affordability has come to the market. And it went from being a reasonably affordable market to having a higher home price to income ratio than San Diego or Greater London, two cities known for being extremely expensive places to live. And which is to say the income, in those communities actually higher than Waterloo region, but their home prices are, um, are also even higher. So when you look at the affordability of buying a home for a local resident, it shows that like for a local resident is actually in some ways less affordable to buy here than some of these uh, cities that are the most expensive in the world. And while that still lags San Francisco, Toronto, or Vancouver, it really shows that from the perspective of affordability for local residents, Waterloo is starting to have comparables to some of the most expensive cities in the world. And this has also been a little bit starting to apply to income. So we look at, uh, sorry, a rent. And we look at the rent of vacant units. So these are units that you can rent on the market at this current point in time. It's not average rent for all units across the market. And it's really the vacant units that are lead the uh, price appreciation. And this is where we see that across all sizes of apartments, we've seen drastic increases in rent in Waterloo region. So uh, a bachelor apartment costs $489 in, in 2008. By 2020, that was 1,089, according to data from the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Uh, so 122% increase, which when we look at every major market across the entire country, again, we see that bachelor apartments have increased in a greater percentage in Waterloo region than anywhere else, which bachelor apartments are typically the units that are most affordable for marginalized folks. So when we see this incredibly rapid appreciation in prices there, faster than anywhere else in the country, this really does disproportionately impact uh, those who are moving into the region, younger people who might be leaving their homes. But uh, you can see this price appreciation is across the board, with three bedroom apartments going up by more than 100%, from less than 1,000 to more than a 2,000 over this 12 year period. And again, this is in the context of those income figures, which are barely increasing faster than inflation. And it's really the compounding of uh, slow income growth with incredibly fast appreciation on home and rents that is causing uh, a lot of folks to be on the uh, in crisis when we talk about affordability. 
The next piece is data from October 2020 looking at the vacancy rate across different apartment rental uh, units. So uh, CMHC broke it down into five categories uh, based on what's affordable to the bottom 20%, the next 20%, the middle 20%, and the top 20%. So uh, looking at these rental ranges, uh, CMHC's uh, Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation says that a healthy vacancy rate in a market is 3%. And we can see that for units renting for more than $14.50 per month, there is a healthy vacancy rate. In, there was a healthy vacancy rate at the time they did the study. And we'll be seeing updates to this probably in January, February next year. But there was a higher uh, than 3% vacancy rate for expensive apartments. But when we look at those that are affordable to the majority of the population, the bottom 60%, all of these were classified as unaffordable. And units that are renting for less than $625 per month, which are affordable to those in the bottom 20% of income in the region, uh, there's a zero percent vacancy. There's absolutely no units available. And I think this really speaks to part of the uh, crisis. And this is not necessarily, you know, we're looking at this data in the current context, you might assume that this is the default. Whereas if you look at 2008, on the other hand, uh, lower price units actually had a higher vacancy rate than higher price units. It's really been this context of increasingly fast uh, price appreciation, where the, the market has flipped that lower price units are completely unavailable, whereas there's this really large supply of, um, of uh, comparatively, of um, more expensive units. And this is also in the context of looking even before we've seen this incredibly rapid price appreciation, particularly in rent and prices uh, over the last five years, but rent really was relatively flat until the last five or six years. But we only have data from the 2011 and 2016 census to see how the number of rental units in different price ranges actually changed. And even before we saw this dramatic, unprecedented, you know, utterly historical increases we've seen in home prices in the last few years, Waterloo Region was already losing quite a few affordable units. So units that were uh, renting for less than $1,000 per, uh, per month, uh, there was a loss uh, between 2011 and 2016 census, uh, or uh, we saw that 6,000 rental units were lost. So a bit more than 1,200 per year. I mean, when we look at the, uh, the fact that like bachelor apartments have increased by 70% in just the last five years alone, chances are this is many times higher annual loss of affordable uh, housing, which really speaks to the context and the necessity of uh, increasing uh, supply on the lower price and the sort of the challenges that folks who need those more affordable units are facing in the current marketplace. On the flip side, when we look at units renting for more than 1500 per month, we see that this actually, uh, more, there's more than four times as many in 2016 than 2011, which really does speak to a lot of the supply that's being created is at the top end of the market, which is why there is a relatively healthy vacancy rate for those units uh, and compared to the more affordable units. So we see at the other end of the market. The other piece we want to explore through this presentation is looking at affordable housing through a variety of different lenses. And so we're going to go through a couple, and I'm just going to leave this quote here, because I think as we're talking through a lot of these contexts and numbers, uh, this quote here that was provided to us by a, a person who's currently living in social housing in the region of Waterloo, or community housing, it's also sometimes called, um, I think really speaks to uh, the challenges that these are having on people living in the region. And I'm going to just, uh, I'll leave it to you to read, but we're going to be talking through housing through the context of economic security, through the context of Indigenous, Black, and racialized individuals, through recent immigrants, through the perspective of gender, through the perspective of people with disabilities, and the perspective of people uh, uh, through the, from the environmental perspective, uh, before wrapping up and then talking about the solutions as part of the panel. So the first piece I'm going to talk about is affordable housing and economic security, which looks at the overall challenge um, uh, in terms of the market conditions and the income side of things in the region. So jobs that are temporary, part-time, or self-employed before the pandemic from 2016 to 2019 were growing at many times the rate of full-time permanent jobs in the region. So temporary jobs over that time that were term or contract grew 69% four times faster than the number of full-time permanent jobs. Uh, temporary jobs overall grew at 2.6 times the rate. You see self-employment also grew at a very rapid rate and part-time employment also uh, grew at a very rapid rate. And there's definitely like, uh, some people are working part-time jobs because they want to, and it helps them manage their, the lifestyle they choose. Uh, some people are working self-employment because this is the ideal living conditions and working conditions for them. Other folks are taking these sorts of employment positions because there's nothing available to them. 
But I think it, there is uh, growth in both of those numbers over time. But one of the real flags in terms of the financial and economic security is that these jobs typically can be eliminated uh, without uh, much notice. They're typically without training uh, budgets. They often come without benefits, retirement plans. And so the jobs that are being created are in, have worse conditions than ones that had been historically, which does leave a lot of the folks who are getting these jobs, which are disproportionately going towards younger folks and uh, recent immigrants. They're leaving them in addition to the other challenges of stagnant income, leaves them with a lot of other out without, excuse me, without a lot of other protections and without a lot of the other things that would come with permanent uh, full-time employment. Uh, during the pandemic, we did see a bit of a reversal of this trend, which is unsurprisingly, perhaps, the jobs that are eliminated are the ones that are self-employed, temporary, part-time. These are the things that it's really easy to decrease hours. So we did see a pretty substantial decrease in those jobs early in the pandemic and ongoing through the pandemic. Well, full-time full -time permanent employment was relatively, uh, uh, did not decrease anywhere near as much, even at the worst of the pandemic. The question really is, as jobs come back, what types of jobs are going to be created? And I think that's an open question that's uh, been uh, many economists have been grappling with as they sort of try to understand where the economy is going to go next. The next piece I want to talk about is uh, the data we do have on annual in uh, income. So Stats Canada has annual income estimates for census families, individuals, and seniors, where they try to break out income for the Kitchener, Cambridge, Waterloo CMA, as well as many other metropolitan areas across the country, looking at how that in affects individuals who are basically not living with as part of a, uh, a couple, um, and how it affects couple families or people who are married or common law. In both cases, when we disaggregate the data, uh, those who are 25 to 34 have actually seen an inflation adjusted decrease in their income over the last uh, 15 years or so. So those who are 25 to 34 who are living alone, uh, so they might not be living alone, but they're part of not they're not part of a census family. So um, they basically are filing their taxes on their own, and their income has actually decreased 13 percent on inflation adjusted period over that time period. Those who are in a couple where the oldest person is 25 to 34 have seen their total income decrease by 4 percent inflation adjusted over that time period, whereas every other age category has seen their income decrease. Decrease, uh, sorry, increase. Every other age category and category has seen their income increase. And this also speaks to the additional challenges that younger people are experiencing because they are the ones likely to get these precarious jobs where their incomes are seeing declines. They are the ones who are having to rent in the current market. And they are the ones who are getting these jobs without benefits. So I want to talk quickly about benefits. And there's a report that uh, Kitchener Waterloo Community Foundation recently published in collaboration with the uh, Green Shield Canada, which specifically explores the state of oral health in Waterloo region. But a lot of the implications are really cross cutting in terms of because uh, we did a deep dive on the exploration of who has access to dental benefits and who doesn't and what are some of the implications. But the folks who don't have access to dental benefits tend to also not have access to retirement saving plans and a lot of these other characteristics. And we look at low income households, the folks who probably need benefits the most, they were 2.8 times as likely to not have dental insurance in the Waterloo region. And the other piece that I thought was really striking uh, in the report in the context of economic security is that the num the low income workers, especially full time low income workers have seen a drastic increase in the percentage who don't have dental insurance over time. And again, this is only one aspect of a whole bunch of different benefits that get wrapped up in employment in Canada. But I think this really speaks to the combination is these sorts of benefits are not considered taxable income. So in addition and beyond the data we saw on the previous slide, these younger folks are much more likely not to have job uh, security. They're not less likely to have benefits. And this is an additional layer of challenges that's being combined together as part of the, uh, the current economy in the region. The next lens we want to explore was affordable housing through Indigenous uh, for Indigenous, Black, and racialized individuals. And this will be a key topic of discussion in our upcoming panel. And so I'm going to go through this a bit quicker. There's a ton of data in the report that's highly valuable, and it's going to be a great point of discussion in a few minutes. Uh, but I did want to, as well, before we dive into it, have a, uh, show this quote from Leanne Hunt, the executive director of the KW Urban Native Wigwam Project. And her key emphasis was when we we're talking about Indigenous data, the data is not correct. 
She mentioned a whole bunch of limitations you can read through here in terms of why we should interpret any of the data that we were able to find, which typically does rely on the census in terms of what's going to be shown on the next slide and a lot of what's shown in the um, uh, their full report. But they really the flag is that even as we did find some real fundamental challenges for the Indigenous community, there was a big flag being that this data should be interpreted with a lot of caution because a lot of Indigenous folks still uh, do, are not identifying as Indigenous, so our data does not capture a lot of the folks folks who are um, uh, struggling. So in terms of the background context, it's really important, in addition to all the other challenges that we talked about previously, uh, poverty rates are more than twice as high for racialized individuals as the 2016. Uh, you, you can see additional notes on the measures of poverty in the, at the bottom or in the full report. Uh, but you see more than twice as high for racialized individuals. So all of those sorts of things of the lack of affordability for units, this is hitting those folks the hardest because they're most likely to be experiencing poverty. And racialized individuals were also three times as 3.5 times as likely to report that they lived in subsidized housing as of the 2016 census, with particularly high rates for Black, Arab, and West Asian residents uh, and Indigenous residents as well. And when we look over time with all these other challenges, the average wait time for community housing in Waterloo Region was 7.9 years for a one bedroom non-senior apartment in 2017, up more than 100% when it was uh, um, three point something years in 2011. So this really shows that like this lack of community and subsidized housing in terms of sufficient supply is really going to disproportionately impact those racialized individuals who have disproportionately relied on it because of systemic dis racism, discrimination, as well as poverty rates that are likewise wrapped up into this really challenging sort of situation. Um, one thing that is like, there's no real concrete local data on some of the housing discrimination and some of the challenges around eviction. There was a really great study done in Toronto looking at eviction rates in predominantly black neighborhood. And they found that even controlling for poverty, immigration status, and a whole bunch of other things that are traditionally um, uh, associated with evictions, uh, the, the neighborhoods with the highest concentration of black residents still had a more than two times higher rates of evictions than the rest. And one of the big things there is you can't control for all the different factors that might be causing that high rate of eviction, but it really does speak to the challenges that are being definitely faced within Southern Ontario for uh, Black, Indigenous, and racialized individuals, uh, even if we don't necessarily have the data we might like to understand how that's under impacting folks in this particular region. The next piece I want to talk about was the data for affordable housing for recent uh, immig immigrants. Um, and um, so this there's so many different challenges, and we're only going to touch on one very quickly uh, in the report, uh, sorry, in this uh, presentation, and there are a bit more detail in the report, but one real issue with this increasing cost, particularly of the more uh, large units, is that uh, recent immigrants, as of the 2016 census, again, before a lot of that price appreciation we saw, uh, about one in five households uh, were living in overcrowded conditions. And this is really, uh, you know, almost uh, seven times higher are six times higher than uh, those who are uh, non-immigrants. So this is a particularly high rate that's probably only going up. And then we look at as well, it's households, not individuals. So their share of the population is even higher. And then when we look at rental units created in the last two years, um, only 8% of them had three or more bedrooms, according to data from the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. And um, that uh, compares to uh, more than 51% uh, of respondents to the 2019 Waterloo Region Immigration Matter Survey, who said their uh, household had four or more people in it. So this, I think, really speaks to, I mean, there's a bunch of different nuances and subtleties to this data. There's a lot more context in the full report, but it does speak to, in some ways, how uh, the types of units being built are not necessarily uh, ideal in terms of the, the space needed for some of these, uh, some of the folks who are moving into the community, especially as population growth has soared. The next piece we're going to talk about is affordable housing and gender. And in this context, there's a couple of quotes here that I think are really worth highlighting. And number one from Elizabeth Clark, who's a regional counselor at the region of Waterloo, as well as the um, CEO of the YW of, KW, of Kitchener Waterloo, uh, which um, 
provides a lot of housing to women in the region. And she noted that more than two thirds of people who are in need of affordable housing are women for a variety of different reasons, including uh, lower incomes, higher rates of poverty, uh, disproportionate impacts of violence. And so this is, uh, I mean, you know, we do have a variety of stats talking about the, the lower income of women and how that affects the overall affordability issues. Uh, we also have a number of facts in there talking about the particular and uh, often drastic impacts um, uh, for lone parent families, which are a majority uh, women led and almost half of them are living in a, uh, what's classified as unaffordable housing and really speaking to those, uh, those challenges that they're facing. In addition to uh, when we compare people who are uh, renters uh, and owners by gender, we see that people who self-identified as female uh, or women were uh, more likely to uh, say that they were having real difficulty paying their bills in the region because of all these different additional barriers. And then another piece on the indigenous women, we didn't see data specifically for this region, but when we looked at national data, like we see like some of the statistics are staggering, like the fact that Indigenous women were more than 15 times more likely to be homeless in one recent national study, um, and also more likely to live in a variety of other conditions that uh, make their housing and uh, little living situation a lot more challenging. Um, and the last piece of here is we really did struggle as well to find uh, data on how trans and non-binary individuals were doing, particularly in the water region. Uh, we do have a quote from Christy Skelton, the acting executive director at Spectrum, who talked about some of the challenges uh, observed by their organization and some of the folks they work with and how, uh, how dangerous this growing um, affordability crisis is as people are increasingly forced to live in circumstances where they don't feel safe because there's not great affordable options for them. The next piece we want to talk about is affordable housing for children and youth, uh, which, um, I mean, when we talk about these greatly increasing prices, there's two sort of sides to it. There's parents with children, and there's sort of the youth themselves, especially as they're moving out uh, and trying to sort of establish themselves in the community. So let's start in first with the stats around uh, people reporting financial difficulties. So the Canadian Housing Survey asked data for people in Waterloo Region and found that 50% of renters with children in the household in 2018, were reporting financial difficulty of some sort, trying to actually make manage all of their different expenses. We compare that to 14% of owners without children in the house. So I mean, this really does speak to when we do have shortages with, uh, in terms of some of the community housing, subsidized housing, when we do have these sorts of conditions where larger units keep getting more and more expensive or incomes that are remaining flat, this is resulting in people, you know, it's a very substantial percentage of folks uh, struggling to be able to make men's ends meet. And many of them are in the end finding ways to do it, but it's not a pleasant or easy or, or uh, ideal. Uh, situation. And this often leaves people with less resources to do all the other things that children need to thrive and succeed. And we do talk about a number of the different data points around people who have different socioeconomic statuses in the region and how uh, children in different conditions are, do have different access to recreational programs, other things that they need to succeed and thrive. The other piece I think is really stunning in the context of the last year is a study done, it was Ontario-wide and with some data on Southern, Southwestern um, uh, Ontario, but almost half of youth 18 to 29 said that they considered moving out of the province in the last year. And this was pretty consistent across all, almost all of Southern Ontario uh, when they broke it out, but they didn't break it out specifically for this region. And I think this really speaks to the lack of connection and some of the risks in terms of social connectedness and social cohesion to these growing housing prices. Because it's getting to the point where people are no longer thinking of themselves as living here once they move out or once they move and sort of start to establish their uh, their broader sort of uh, life, and um, and I think this is a really staggering point because like a couple of years ago, people were sort of talking about, hey, maybe I'll move to a smaller city outside of a major city. Or people in Toronto were saying, hey, maybe I'll move to KW. Um, there, you know, are all these areas around. Now they're sort of looking at these areas and be like, I can't afford those either. And they're starting to have these conversations of I'm going to move entirely out of the province. And this is going to have significant disruptions to social networks and the implications of this on the local economy, the ability to sort of develop and continue to grow uh, innovative businesses and all sorts of other things. Like this is a thing that will have a wide array of ripples going forward, especially when we look in those contexts of the, the declining income um, uh, and lowering declining quality of jobs that we talked about earlier in the presentation. 
The next piece, uh, we're going to talk about again, uh, people with disabilities. And again, the, like many of these topics, it's just uh, we're only going to be touching a fraction of what we cover in the report. But one of the things we, ha we highlight is the Canadian Disability Survey estimated about there's 40,000 people with severe disabilities in Waterloo Region, about 12,000 of whom uh, receive support from the Ontario Disability Support Program. Um, and the poverty rates for those with severe disabilities in that survey nationally was almost three times higher. So when we look at these sorts of conditions of rapidly growing home prices uh, and rental rates, uh, with uh, in Ontario, the ODSP support rate on an inflation adjusted basis is about 30% lower than it was a couple of decades ago. So uh, incomes that are down, costs are up, leaving the folks who are on ODSP in uh, somewhat frightening conditions. I mean, an average bachelor apartment in Waterloo Region uh, consumes about 68% of someone on ODSP as a, ODSP's income in 2020, up from 41% in 1994. If you're a, a younger person who's going to rent a vacant bachelor apartment, it's getting to about more than 80% of your ODSP income would be going just towards paying for rent, let alone, you know, utilities, let alone food, transportation, or any of these other costs. And I mean, it's increasingly a situation where, uh, you know, people are really struggling and uh, you know, even the most basic necessities of food is increasingly relying on food charities like the Food Bank of Waterloo Region or you know, other charities that are providing them sufficient things to make ends meet because their income can no longer uh, do it in any context if they're not in some sort of subsidized housing, which uh, there is not enough of to support those folks. The last piece we're going to talk about before going to the panel is on the affordable housing and the environment. And uh, in that context, uh, again, we, we talk about a whole bunch of different dimensions in the report. Um, we're going to focus on some of the things about affordability, though I do really want to emphasize some great points that we, uh, we, we had quotes from a variety of experts. Um, we'll leave this one on the slide, but in this report, we're going to talk about the affordability side of things. But affordability uh, is so intricately to, uh, tied to livability quality of life, uh, the overall environment in which people live. And uh, we're only touching on this side, unfortunately, about affordability, so we can wrap up and get into the great panel discussion that's coming. So the data we saw, 19% of homes in Waterloo Re Region uh, were living in energy poverty, so spending more than 6% of after-tax income on energy. Uh, when we, uh, Canadian Housing Survey from 2018 found that 35% of Kitchener Cambridge Waterloo residents uh, reported they were not satisfied with the energy efficiency of their home. So, like a really large opportunity for improving, even as two thirds said they were either sat very satisfied or sat satisfied. And one of the things we saw talking to the community experts was there was a bit of a mismatch sometimes in environmental programs versus some of what the data was showing from the Canadian Housing Survey in terms of needs. So, half 47% of those dissatisfied with the energy efficiency of their home say major repairs are needed compared to less than 5% of those who are satisfied. So 10 times more folks who have said there was energy problems in their house said there was major repairs also needed. But when we talk to experts in the space, they were often likely to say that the energy programs that are in existence almost never support basic repairs. So if you're missing drywall, if you're basic base, you know, you have uh, windows that are broken. This is not what energy programs typically fund. But for those who are struggling most, like they can't afford to make those. So they're often paying a ton of energy because they can't afford the upfront costs to make basic repairs. The other piece we heard was uh, when we looked at the data from the survey is renters were more likely to say there was all sorts of environmental issues in including energy efficiency, uh, lack of control, uh, air quality issues, all these sorts of things, but they were the least likely to have any sort of programs. And what we heard uh, from the folks we talked to in the report, and uh, you can see their quotes in the full uh, report, it was that there's almost no programs to incentivize uh, landlords or uh, apartment buildings to sort of look at making these, uh, these uh, environmental upgrades that can both improve air quality, livability, uh, environmental efficiency. And so it's really, in many cases, the programs are you know, doing a good job at supporting uh, home owners who are able to put up front capital and uh, leaving a lot of other folks who are reporting more significant needs behind. And so I'll pass it off to Elizabeth next time. Uh, next, I will say that uh, our report itself called for 25 different actions that, uh, you know, that people recommended and sort of brought up. And that's uh, really, there's a, I re highly recommend you take a look through some of them and I'll pass it off to Elizabeth to uh, highlight the next steps for this, both the present uh, for today, as well as uh, anything else. 
Great. Thanks so much, Steve. And a great job trying to condense 60 or 65 pages of a report into about a half an hour. And so lots of uh, commentary in the chats about various other groups. Um, and so uh, please take a look at the full report when we do release it later on today. And I think you'll find the answers to some of those points. Um, and um, I'll also ask Steve just to take a look at the Q&A uh, as we're going through the panel. So as you've said, Steve, there are about 25 action items in the report that were generated from suggestions from the community. And one of the action items that KWCF is committed to is convening conversations, which is what we're continuing to do today. I would now like to invite Firial Diwan, our recently hired Housing Impact Program Manager, and Tanil Warren, Racial Equity and Anti-Oppression Educator, to please join us. We are sharing their bios in the chat now. And Steve, I'll also ask you to please stay on for the panel discussion. Thank you. So welcome, Ferial and Tanil, and thank you again for uh, being with us today. There is a lot of content to cover in the next uh, 25 minutes. So let's just jump right into the questions. Um, so both Tanil and Ferial, I'm going to open this first question up to both of you. So what did you find most interesting or what stood out to you most in the report? Um, and or what was most sobering? Uh, that term has certainly come up uh, quite a bit in the chat. So um, did you have any key aha moments when you read the report or listened to Steve's presentation today? So uh, which one of you wants to jump in first? I'll pick then, Tanil, <laughs> I wanted to jump in. Um, I think what is most sobering, uh, if you're paying attention, is the data is just the beginning. Um, and that is that is the, the frightening part is that we, we're at the beginning of this conversation, um, uh, you know, working closely with the report coming together and just seeing Steve have to do so much digging to answer some of the questions that came up really highlighted the gaps in how we're collecting data locally. Um, so that was kind of what my main takeaway is, is how do we build on this and improve data collection processes within Waterloo Region um, so that we can answer the questions and we can action um, the recommendations that came forward. And the you see the inequities, the social inequities are clear because the communities that we continually say are not being represented, don't have a voice, that's what the data shows. Yeah, very important. Thank you, Tanil. And Firiel? Sure. Um, first of all, I want to thank Steve for putting this report together. It's no easy task. Um, I think one thing that really stood out to me was the cost of housing and how much it's gone up over the years. It was really shocking to see what are this cost of housing on par with the cost of housing in San Diego. Um, and as Steve presented, the cost of housing is 8.6 times higher than the estimated median household income in 2021. And if you look at cost of bachelor apartments in Kitchener Waterloo, so that's 1,089 to 1,700 dollars. I mean, someone on an unstable income can't afford that and might not even be able to rent something, you know, due to their income. Um, and I've heard many immigrants say in Kitchener Waterloo that sometimes landlords will expect an income of sixty thousand dollars per year, which is not something that they're going to be able to afford. So this prevents families and individuals from having access to housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And, and Firial, you know, the report also mentions a backlog being created in the housing continuum where people can't afford to move along it. So can you speak more about, uh, you know, about that and where to and for whom this is problematic? Sure. Uh, I think it's important to remember when looking at the housing continuum that it's the end goal is not home ownership. It's about long term access to a roof over your head, whether you own it or not. It's about having a safe secure place to live. And I do think that the housing continuum excludes housing models um, that are out of the norm, like tiny homes, trailers, encampments, spaces like a better tent city. Uh, there's a lot of nimbyism around this. And um, that's one of the reasons why a better tent city is having a hard time finding a permanent space to settle. Uh, and we need to be able to work with communities to tackle this housing crisis. Um, I think we need to get creative to reduce the long waiting lists uh, mentioned in the report, uh, preserving what's left of our affordable housing and advocating for affordable rental housing is one way to do it. Um, and you know, this impacts marginalized communities the most. Um, and if you look at the report and the disparity between income and rent for a racialized individual um, and, and while facing housing discrimination, it's, it's a lot to handle. Uh, this can have a huge mental and emotional um, effect on tenants 
um, when they're trying to maintain their housing, especially for individuals who are on ODSB and OW and your low income uh, groups. Um, so when people earn, what people earn isn't enough to pay their rent in the long run. And we need to be able to find ways to bridge that the gap between the two. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, Tanil, I'm going to turn this uh, next question over to you. So um, please talk a bit about how the inadequacy of social payments, whether that be Ontario Works or ODSP, as well as the minimum wage, quite frankly, is exacerbating our housing issues in the region. And who is most impacted? Uh, well, in short, it's not enough. Um, you know, uh, just this week, there was an article in the paper um, about a, un a building that's been taken over and the rent has been doubled. So you're looking at a studio that was 850 and now it starts at 1323. A one bedroom starts at 1630. If you're on ODSP, shelter is 642. Um, if you're on OW, shelter is 390. Um, and, you know, I can speak from the immigrant experience um, moving here in 2010. Um, and, you know, after moving out of a hostel into a studio unit, um, I was on a fixed income of $1,000 a month. And the rent for that unit was $745. And then a transportation pass was $100. And then you have food. And then I'm a student and I need to be able to. And so there are, all of these things start to compound. Um, and that $1,000 is more than if I was on OW, which is a total of 733. So I think that fairly contextualizes the problem there. Um, I don't think OW exacerbates the issue because it doesn't control the issue. Um, the idea that we think is a reasonable amount that $390 should be covering housing is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and that impacted primarily it impacts Indigenous people, Black people, immigrants, people on disabilities, um, trans and non-binary population. Uh, and, it, and when you have those multiple identities, women, women fleeing domestic violence, uh, we could go on. I mean, the data is clear on this. And so we have a responsibility to preserve affordable housing, to preserve social housing. Um, when I think about the location of that building and what I know about the population of that community, lots of new immigrants are moving into that community. That's a racialized community. So what we can say without even looking at it is that they have been priced out and whoever is in that building, there's a likelihood that they will age in place. So that's a really good example of the mismatch um, that the data speaks to. Right, yeah, for sure. And Ferial, you know, we talked about a little bit, uh, Steve touched on about rent evictions, a term that unfortunately, uh, most people know what that means now. Um, but um, it, it seems to be a growing issue. And what more can we do about that? And what will it take to maintain more of our affordable housing stock? Sure. Um... I can talk a little bit about the issues around rent evictions. Um, so based on the mapping displacement project conducted by Social Development Center with Dr. Barton Set and conversations that I've had with Michelle Knight and Holly George, who are part of the eviction prevention team at Social Development Center, there's a lot of forced evictions, more so rent evictions. And that means tenants are experiencing harassment from their landlords, lack of maintenance, which can be a public health concern, uh, community communication issues, income insecurity. Um, and this harassment and discrimination is amplified for tenants who are, uh, like Tanil has mentioned, from low income groups, seniors, Black, Indigenous, racialized communities, from LGBTQ or S communities, who are disabled, seniors. And this has a huge impact on tenants' mental and emotional health and we need to start holding landlords accountable and when it comes to rent eviction some things to remember are when um, tenants receive an end notice from your landlord it doesn't mean anything unless the landlord tenant board has approved the eviction and so from what uh, the eviction prevention team has heard is most landlords end up avoiding the landlord tenant board because tenants don't know their rights and tenants have the first right of refusal to return to their suites once they're renovated once it's renovated and so if they want to they need to get that in writing um, and I think the first and foremost thing to do is to educate tenants on their rights because it's a key part of trying to maintain that affordable housing stock. The next question speaks to any potential um, gaps or further information that could be uh, gleaned from new data processes. And this is something that I, I kept thinking about as we worked through the report and 
I think one of the things that we learned through COVID is the significant amount of advocacy that excluded groups have to do in order to be seen. And so we need to be able to improve the ways in which we collect data from uh, communities and populations that lack systemic trust. Uh, and, and we see that in this, um, in this data issue. We also need more qualitative data. And I say that because we're dealing with populations that one of the things that hampers um, their support is that they're fundamentally small populations. Um, and with that size and population, they often get ignored when we're running on a numerological um, structure. So I think that we need to increase qualitative data. Um, we need to improve partnerships with organizations that have access to these communities. Um, our position on the fact that we see Leanne's um, quote about self-identifying indigenous folks, what that tells us is that they don't trust the system. So how are we going to get effective data to support these communities if they don't trust us to even tell us that they're there? Um, and how do we move forward in that in that paradigm? The other thing is the seniors data um, was essentially absent because I don't know um, if we're doing a very good job of gathering that as a region. Uh, so that's something, that's a community that I'm really thinking about. Um, and I'm thinking about the intersections with seniors as well. Uh, we do have a, a a significant senior immigrant population. We're looking at the intersection of, of gender identity, sexual orientation. Uh, the, in, the multiple marginalizations in data collection is really where I want to see uh, improvement. And the tenancy experience, the overlap between housing and health. Uh, Ferial has mentioned mental health uh, quite a bit. Where are we getting this data? A clear relationship between housing and employment. So uh, the, the people who make all the decisions who can put all the money into this data collection, um, you know, over to you. Thanks, and uh, thanks for handling that as the professionals that you are. Well, my computer decided to take a little bit of a coffee break. Um, so uh, I think, you know, what, what I've seen quite a bit of in the chat is around, you know, what are the actions that we're going to take from here? And so, you know, there were many actions that were identified through the report that you've both seen, all of you have seen. And um, do you think that the community should act on first? So which ones should they act on first? Or are there other actions you think that we should act on that weren't even indicated in the report? And so I'll turn it to Firiel first, please. Sure. Um, I don't think there's one thing we need to do first and there's no one, like one solution won't be enough. Um, I think we need to do a lot at the same time. Uh, we need to advocate to, you know, advocate to your constituents to um, build more, or like preserve affordable, accessible housing. Um, we need more affordable rental housing options. Um, you know, we need to support organizations who are working to tackle these systemic issues and support community members, um, you know, who support community members with housing. Uh, we need better policies for around rent control, vacancy taxes, inclusionary zoning. And if you are privileged, if you are privileged and you're a homeowner, uh, or, you know, you own a laneway home, build a tiny home or a secondary in-law suite to your home. The region and the cities, city of Kitchener and city of Waterloo both permit this. Um, and region of Waterloo has a program called Ontario Renovates Program to help fund renovations if you're building an affordable unit. Um, we need to invest in affordable housing. Um, we need to de decriminalize homelessness and encampments. Um, uh, and we need to preserve affordable housing where tenants are paying low market rent, um, below market rent. Uh, something that Union Co-op has been working on in the region. And this came up several times in the mapping to space and research as well, where many parts have expressed losing housing they could afford all below market rent to evictions, to rent evictions, ownership changes, poor management, landlord harassment. So we need landlords who care. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to Neil, uh, same question over to you, please. Um, so for me, I took this question and I was like, well, who is the community? That's a that's a broad that's a broad ask. So if I'm, I'm gonna start with the three articles we've seen this week, um, and I'm gonna say the first thing that we could do is stop exploiting poverty for profit. Um, so I'll just start there. And you know, I'm always looking at who is in attendance. And I think that we need to recognize the housing health gap significantly. And we also need to help people who are providing social housing services. We need greater investment in housing support workers um, we know the limitations of the Landlord-Tenant Act, and we have heard housing providers say that our tenants need better support, 
and we need to provide that support. And they can't do that because they are landlords. So we need housing support um, to, be, to be there. I think that we need to find a way for municipalities, regions to move to immediately preserve units that we know can be bought up um, by exploitative property developers for affordable and social housing. Uh, these are things that are uh, important to me and actions I think that we should take. And as communities, we need to start delegating. If we believe that housing should be available and accessible to all people, we need to start delegating at municipalities, um, council meetings, we need to delegate at next regional budget meeting. And we need to start asking some tough questions of the townships because the townships are really getting away from not participating in this conversation. And there's a lot of land in townships. So, and the final thing that I wanna say is we need to prioritize reconciliation and how we're going to work with the indigenous community I personally don't think that I should be receiving requests to donate basic construction supplies to KW Urban Wing One Project. Um, there should be an indigenous housing uh, initiative run within the region of Waterloo, um, investing in indigenous housing and allowing the indigenous community to lead that process. So that's what I think the community uh, should do next. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Tanil, for those last words. And, um, you know, I, I could just say, wow, I think that, um, you know, Feriel, Tanil, um, Steve, both the insights that you shared in this panel discussion, but also in the report itself, which I know um, all of you, all of, and I don't mean all of you in the audience, but all of you on the screen here today um, have been instrumental in helping us uh, pull together this report. So thank you so much for your knowledge, your expertise, your guidance has and will continue to inform KWCF's work in the area of affordable housing, as well as social justice. KWCF's board and team are committed to action. We are focused on ensuring our affordable housing supply will grow, which will ensure safe, appropriate, and affordable housing for vulnerable, marginalized, under-resourced Waterloo Region community members. So please stay tuned for updates on this work and other research initiatives that we'll be launching over the coming months and will form part of our future Do More Good dialogues. So to wrap up, the Waterloo Region Vital Signs Report is being distributed later this afternoon. Everyone who registered for this session will get an email linking you to the report. And we're also sending it to everyone who's on our e-distribution list. So you may receive two emails, but hopefully that means you won't miss seeing it. As mentioned at the start of this webinar, this has been recorded and we've also captured the questions that were submitted. Thanks to Steve for being able to answer some of those comments and questions in the chat and the Q&A during our panel discussion. Uh, but for those that were, were not responded to, we will uh, share those along with the recording and other useful links and they'll be available on our website soon. And a follow-up survey will be sent to all attendees as well because we really value your um, opinion about these sessions and uh, help us to improve. So thank you for attending this session. Thanks again to our panelists and to Steve and for coming along on this journey with us. So. Bye for now.